So, whoops, gone one too far. Yeah, so, um, hi. I've been fighting over internet regulations since 2002, and back then the big issue was whether Napster should be liable for the things that its users did. And back then, it was a real struggle to convey to people that the outcome of the Napster fight was about so much more than access to music. It was about whether the network that would someday grow to be our planetary scale nervous system for our whole species would be regulated as though it were some kind of troublesome jukebox. Then as the years went by, something changed. People woke up to the fact that the internet wasn't just a glorified video on demand service or the world's greatest pornography distribution system or the best way ever conceived of for recruiting jihadis to commit acts of terror. People started to see the internet as a tool that had become essential to their family lives their romantic lives, their education, their employment, their political and their civic engagement, their play and their business. And all of that didn't mean that we couldn't ever hope to regulate the internet, but it did mean that we needed to regulate it carefully, with gravitas, and a sense that any misstep could have unintended consequences that would ripple out into many domains of our lives. And I started to hold out hopes that we might be able to not only regulate the internet well in the future, but that we might even reverse our stupidest mistakes of the past. Like those rules that ban circumvention of copyright protection systems. Those rules were originally intended to add legal weight to nuisances like having region coding and DVD players. And the way that it works is that infringing, um, uh, or rather removing a copyright lock constitutes an infringement even if you don't violate copyright. And, and it had to work that way because deregionalizing a DVD player, that's not a copyright infringement. It's the opposite of a copyright infringement. If, if you go overseas and you buy a DVD from the store and you pay the price that they've asked and you take it back home and then you watch it, that's, that's the opposite of piracy, right? That's what copyright is supposed to do. It's supposed to say you, you go and you pay the price that you're asked and then you enjoy it in the way that you're expected to. And so the only way that these anti-circumvention rules could be effective at stopping you from deregionalizing your DVD player is if they banned uh, removing a copyright lock even when you didn't infringe copyright. So uh, even so, it, it wasn't hard to remove these locks, and so they needed a legal backstop that, that uh, included a, a legal prohibition as well as a, a technical measure. And, um, you know, as, uh, and originally this confined itself to just these fringe applications like DVD players and the Sega Dreamcast, things where you had a copyright lock to protect something that wasn't protected by copyright. But over time, anything that had software in it grew a copyrighted work in it, because all software is copyrighted, and so once you have a device with, with, co with uh, software inside of it, you can add a copyright lock, and all of a sudden these anti-circumvention rules, like Article 6 of the European Copyright Directive from 2001 and Section 121 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, suddenly ban changing that device to do legal things. And so over time, we started to see copyright locks creeping from DVD players and Sega Dreamcast into every application of our lives. So now we have copyright locks and implanted defibrillators and in car engines and in thermostats and in coffee makers and in voting machines and in tractors. And these laws, they're an attractive nuisance because they promise manufacturers that if they skin their products in a one molecule thick layer of digital rights management, and design them so that using the product in any way the manufacturer doesn't like involves removing the copyright lock, then they can make it illegal to use a product in the way that the manufacturer doesn't like. And in the US, violating this law, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, it's punishable by a five-year prison sentence and a $500,000 fine for a first offense. And so what that means is that if you use a copyright lock judiciously, you can bootstrap a new legal regime called felony contempt of business model, where your customers using the products that you sell them in ways that benefit them 
instead of your shareholders becomes a literal crime and the taxpayers will pay to enforce it. Uh, but worse still, these laws, they chill security research because when a security researcher reveals that there's a defect in a system with a copyright lock, they make it easier to remove that copyright lock. And so security researchers treat these as a no-go zone, and they don't want to talk about the defects in these systems. And so now we have this ever-expanding constellation of devices that treat their owners as their adversaries, that security researchers can't audit, that um, good guys know about bugs in, but they won't tell you about them, and bad guys know about bugs in them, and they get to exploit them uh, forever because the good guys never tell you that the products you're using are defective. So these laws were ripe for reform. But as the years went by and people got online and network policy touched more corners of their lives, the absurdity of copyright law, the, this, this idea, this, this regulatory framework for the entertainment industry being the one tool that we would use to regulate all of our online lives, it just became more obvious how foolish that was. And it seemed like the time was ready, ready for a change, like maybe we were arriving at a moment when we would start to take network policy seriously instead of treating it as this evidence-free zone. But then the last 12 months happened. <laughs> and the last 12 months have been a nightmare assault, a kind of blitzkrieg of terrible network policies swiftly ushered into law with little or no public debate and in the worst of faith. We had the Australian ban on working security systems and America's attack on the online discussion of sex and sexuality and the European mandate on copyright filters for all human expression. And now in the wake of the Christchurch white terrorist attacks, we have global initiatives requiring that online platforms be ready to take down material that is allegedly terroristic at the drop of a hat so quickly that humans couldn't possibly review uh, the, these, uh, the material before it's taken down. And these are already law in Australia, and they're steaming towards becoming law in Europe and in the UK. The last year has been a real-time, high-speed chinification of our Western internet, a system where our networks are increasingly subject to surveillance and control that has not been dreamt of since the old days when every uh, communication that we had electronically went through one state-owned monopoly telephone company that had total control over who spoke, who they spoke to, and could monitor any one of those calls. But unlike those days, when the telephone that you use was wired into your kitchen and attached to the wall, now the telephones are in our pockets, and they know everywhere we go and everything we do and everyone we talk to, um, and those are now subject to a kind of control that even exceeds the control that we had in the day of the telco monopolies. And unlike those days, if you want to spy on all of our communications, you don't need to hire a giant room full of Stasi snitches to listen in. Unlike those days, we can now just get an algorithm to listen to everybody. And I want to take a moment before I go on to how we got here to just review in detail all the terrible stuff that's happened in the last year because in 2019, news comes at you fast and it's easy to miss things as they happen. So let's start with the ban on working cryptography. Since the late 1980s, law enforcement and surveillance apparatuses have been warning that if everyone had access to cryptography, uh, that terrible things would happen. Until 1992, the American uh, National Security Agency, they classed any working cryptography as a form of munition, and they refused to allow civilians to have access to working crypto. And instead, they had a toy uh, scrambling system called DES50 that they said was so strong that bank robbers and criminals and foreign spies would never break it. But at the same time, it was so weak that the NSA could break into it to spy on bad guys if they absolutely had to. And in 1992, the Electronic Frontier Foundation represented an undergraduate, uh, or grad student rather, at the University of California at Berkeley named Daniel J. Bernstein, DJB, who's now a very famous cryptographer. And DJB, he was publishing strong cryptography as open source, as free software, on the early internet, before the web. He was publishing it on Usenet. Uh, which was a messaging platform, and who's posting source code to it. And we argued to the uh, Ninth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals 
that publishing source code was a form of expressive speech and was protected under the American Constitution, under, under uh, the, the First Amendment. And the Ninth Circuit agreed with us, and then the Appellate Division agreed with us, the National Security Agency, they didn't like their chances at the Supreme Court. And since then, we've all had access to working cryptography, cryptography that works so well that when you take a picture with your phone, if the full disk encryption is turned on, which it is by default now, then before the picture is even saved, it has been scrambled so thoroughly that if every hydrogen atom in the universe were turned into a computer, and it did nothing between now and the death of the universe, but try and guess what key was needed to unscramble your picture without asking you for the password, we would run out of universe before we ran out of possible unscrambling keys. So crypto really works. Um, and today, every one of us uses strong encryption all day long. Uh, every network we use automatically encrypts our data between us and the router. Every Bluetooth device we use automatically encrypts our, our keystrokes so that they can't be intercepted uh, by people who are standing nearby us. Um, when your computer or your printer or any other device receives a software update from the manufacturer, we use crypto to make sure that it came from the software manufacturer and that it wasn't inserted by a malicious party in order to attack you by either compromising your device and steal its data or compromising your device and having it break into other devices on your network. Um, crypto protects the integrity of your data and it protects the integrity of your communications, and it protects your devices. It's what stands between you and identity theft, or someone murdering you by compromising that computer in your car or in the defibrillator implanted in your chest. Which is great news uh, if, you're, if you want to protect yourself from malicious attacks. But authoritarians have never given up on the project of breaking working crypto, and they cite the four horsemen of the information apocalypse whenever they say that it's time to get rid of crypto at last. Those four horsemen are pedophiles, terrorists, criminals, and drug dealers. And they insist that it is possible to ban working crypto, but still make people safe from criminals. Now, the former Prime Minister of Australia, Malcolm Turnbull, he was very big on this. He said that he was going to ban working crypto in Australia, but he would nevertheless have crypto that would protect Australians from bad guys. And when mathematicians told him that it violated the laws of mathematics, to say that we would develop an, an encryption system that worked perfectly when bad guys were trying to attack it, but failed perfectly when good guys were trying to attack it. He said the stupidest thing in the history of internet regulation. That is a crowded field, but I think you'll agree that he wins. He said, the, law of, the laws of Australia prevail in Australia. I can assure you of that. The laws of mathematics are very commendable, but the only law that applies in Australia is the law of Australia. <laughs> Now you laugh, and you should laugh, because it's, it's, it's risible that a grown-ass adult in a suit with high office said this thing. But a year later, Australia banned working crypto. And they passed a law that requires any technology company with a nexus with the Australian government to insert backdoors into their crypto on demand. So that's what's happened in the encryption wars in the last year. Now let's talk about everyone's favorite subject, sex. Uh, the world's democracies, when the internet came along, they needed to figure out how to relate to the internet, um, what, what the liability regime would be. And the answer they came up with is something we call safe harbors. And um, th the way that safe harbors work is they try to preserve a platform for speech, but also uh, create a streamlined system of justice for people who are harmed by that speech. So let's think about how this works in the offline world. In the offline world, people who are party to bad speech are often liable for it. So if you're a bookseller and your bookstore has an infringing book, under many copyright systems, you, the bookseller, can be held liable for selling the infringing book, even if you didn't know it was infringing, even if the publisher promised you that it, it was in compliance with copyright law. And so people who are uh, aggrieved under copyright law, they can pick the person in the value chain with the deepest pockets, the publisher, the printer, the bookseller, and they can go after them, one of them or all of them, uh, and, and, uh, and get justice out of them. Now, um, that would be really hard for people who provide online platforms for speech because uh, you couldn't possibly hope to evaluate everything that a user said on, say, Twitter or even on your local bulletin board system for people who really like cats. And knowing that everything that's posted to that bulletin board complies with copyright law and hasn't been pasted from another cat board by someone who really liked a message and wanted to pass it off as their own. 
And so it would be impossible to have a platform for speech if you were on the hook for copyright. And so what safe harbors do is they take platforms off the hook for, for bad speech acts by their users. But people who are, uh, who are damaged by those users' speech, they get something in return. I used to be a bookseller, and I worked in a bookstore. And if we had a book that you thought infringed your copyright, you could not walk into the bookstore, point at the book on the shelf, and say, that book infringes my copyright. I demand that you remove it right now. The minimum wage clerk behind the, the counter would say, you'll have to talk to my boss. And the boss would say, you'll have to talk to a judge. And once you have a court order, we'll remove that book for you. And safe harbors, they do away with this due process as well. They allow people who've been harmed by bad acts of speech to simply present a claim to the online's platform, and usually to some, the equivalent of me behind the, the cash register, some minimum wage employee, often in a, a Pacific Rim uh, uh, data center or you know, call center, and they get an email that says, this infringes my copyright, this uh, is harassing me, this is doing something else that, is, that constitutes a bad speech act. I want it removed from the internet. And more often than not, it just disappears without ever having to talk to a judge. So this is the balance the safe harbor struck. We immunize platforms from the bad speech acts of their users, and we give users the power to remove bad speech if it harms them without having to speak to a judge. And then when there's a disagreement there, then it all goes to court. And this is a wildly imperfect system with many defects, but we have managed to find a worse one to replace it with. So um, in the US, the safe harbors regime, it didn't protect companies that knowingly allowed sex trafficking to happen on their platforms. If you had actual knowledge that one of your users was engaged in sex trafficking, you had liability if you didn't shut it down. But that wasn't enough. Um, in 2018, the US Congress passed a bill called FOSTA-SESTA, SESTA-FOSTA, depending on whether you like Congress or the Senate more. And SESTA-FOSTA says that you have an obligation to know whether any of the speech on your platform involves sex trafficking. So it's not enough that um, uh, if you know about it, you have to take it down. Now you have a duty to find out whether there's sex trafficking taking place. And this is a duty that's very hard to fulfill because it's hard to know a priori if you're on a message board where consenting adults are talking about having sex with one another, whether one of them isn't consenting, right? whether one of them is being, is being trafficked. That duty turned out to be so onerous that uh, virtually every platform in which people discussed sex and sexuality for the purposes of consummating a sexual relationship in the US shut down. And this has been uh, uh, a great harm to actual sex workers who now tell us that because they've lost every forum in which they used to warn each other about clients who were violent or dangerous, that they now face much more violence. And since they can no longer arrange online assignations, they're walking the streets again. And the only people who've benefited from SESTA-FOSTA, the only people whose lives have been made conclusively better, are pimps. Because now that sex workers are working on the street again, they need to have pimps for protection. This has been a golden age for, uh, for pimping as a result of this uh, bill that was notionally intended to protect people from human trafficking. Sex has become the go-to means for attacking privacy, anonymity, and speech. Starting this summer, uh, in the United Kingdom, every platform that provides access to erotic material, adult material, will be required to validate the age of every user who accesses that material. If you're a UK-based site and you don't adhere to this, your site will be, uh, you will be punished under British law. If you're an offshore site and you don't adhere to this, you'll be blocked at the border using the national firewall. And these age checks will require a credit card. So that when these databases leak, not if these databases leak, when these databases leak, um, uh, the attackers will be able to cross-reference your sexual fetishes with how much money you have and whether it's worth blackmailing you. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and so that's what's happening in the UK. And then there's Tumblr. Poor Tumblr. <laughs> Tumblr was once a haven for sexual expression. Uh, including notably women's sexual expression and sexual expression by LG LGBTQI people. And in 2018, Apple got really worried about SESTA-FOSTA, and they said, we're not going to carry the Tumblr app anymore because it might involve sex trafficking. And this was the spur that uh, Tumblr needed to deploy algorithms 
to root out and delete anything that might be sexual content on the system. But algorithmic filters are crude and imperfect instruments. These are all uh, items from my own Tumblr that have been blocked by Tumblr. And I want to particularly call your attention to the one on the far left there. Um, that is Tumblr's image, uh, example image, of the kind of nudity that Tumblr will not block. It's been blocked by Tumblr. <laughs> yeah. So speaking of filters, last month, the European Union took the most drastic step to censor and centralize the internet in the history of the so-called free world. The European Parliament passed the copyright directive, including the dreaded Article 13, which is now Article 17, because nothing is ever easy in the European Parliament. <laughs> so Article 13, it's a rule that obliterates the safe harbor not for sex trafficking or for cryptography, but for, for copyright infringement. It makes li platforms liable if their users infringe copyright. And like SESTA, this rule applies even if you think that your users aren't infringing copyright, even if you don't have actual knowledge of the infringement, which creates effectively a duty to monitor everything your users post to find out whether or not they're violating the copyright directive. Now, that has to mean filters. Of course it means filters. YouTube alone gets 400 hours of video every minute. There just aren't enough human beings who understand copyright on Earth to review all of the footage that YouTube's users upload and make a determination about whether all of that footage, any of that footage, infringes copyright. And despite the fact that this obviously meant filters, during the debate, the proponents of the copyright directive insisted that it didn't require filters. In fact, they said right there in the directive, it says, if at all possible, don't use filters. Well, all right. If I made a law that said I require you to produce a large, gray, charismatic African land mammal, and it must have four legs and a tail and tusks and a trunk, but if, it, but if at all possible, it should not be an elephant, I would still get an elephant. And if we say the directive requires that you know about all of the things your users post and make sure that they don't infringe copyright, and you have users who post more than any human moderation team could review, you will always get filters. And now we know, of course, that it means that we're going to get filters. Um, because within days of the directive passing, the French government announced that it would transpose this into law with filters. And then the German government admitted that it would probably need filters too in its national implementation. And then the commissioner who pushed for this said that, of course, it was going to require filters despite what he'd said earlier. So, in 2017, Germany became one of the world's great net, net exporters of privacy rules. In 2019, Germany and France teamed up to take away from America the World Cup for exporting the world's worst privacy and censorship regimes. Everything we post from now on is going to be compared to a database of copyrighted works and blocked if an algorithm thinks it looks too much like a copyrighted work. But of course, when I say it's going to be matched against a database of copyrighted works, that's not quite true. It's going to be matched against a database of works that someone says are copyrighted. But there's no checks and balances in the system to determine whether or not all the works that are included are copyrighted. There's nothing to stop someone from claiming the works of uh, 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 William Shakespeare or the alphabet or the song Happy Birthday, and it's blocked until someone goes in and pulls those records out, makes a determination and pulls those records out. And when we propose that there should be a rule that punishes people for negligently or deliberately adding material to, the, to these copyright block lists that they don't own the copyright to, that proposal was shot down in flames. And so after the directive goes into effect, you might have uh, uh, images of a cop hitting a protester at a demonstration disappearing thanks to a spurious copyright claim, or a picture of a company's effluent pipe dumping toxic waste into your drinking water. And the remedy will be to get in line behind everyone else whose materials were unjustly blocked and ask to have it unblocked. But there's more, because just two weeks after this directive passed, there was an act of terrible white supremacist violence in New Zealand where a, a, a terrorist shot up two mosques in Christchurch. Uh, and in the wake of that attack, which was live streamed on Facebook, everyone around the world has been getting in line to figure out how to punish the platforms for letting this happen. So um, in Australia, 
They've passed a rule requiring platforms to remove material of a terroristic nature within an hour. Uh, and in the European Union, we're, we're advancing the terror regulation, which has the same regime. And the UK, in the mother of all parliaments, just tabled uh, further evidence towards making this the reality there. And in case you're thinking that this sounds reasonable because anything that it takes to remove terrorist material from the internet is probably worth it, given how horrific that attack was, consider that last month, the French government their anti-terror police sent a notice to the Internet Archive, the people who run the Internet Wayback Machine and host open access collections, and they said, we have identified within, your, within these three special collections terroristic works, and we require that they be removed within 24 hours. The three collections they identified were the Gutenberg Archive, which is every public domain book that's ever been scanned, 15 million text files, and the Internet Col Archive's collection of Grateful Dead recordings. They gave them 24 hours to sort through this, but under the pending UK EU terror regulation, they would only have one hour to make sense of it, and they would face being blocked at the border uh, if, if uh, they failed to comply. And these uh, demands, they're not signed by a judge, they're not reviewed by anyone. Um, and the European Union terror regulation originally included filters as a requirement, and they were removed at the last moment. But again, if, if you're gonna get rules that require you to sift through tens of millions of documents in one hour, there's no way that you're going to be able to do that without filters. Uh, almost overnight, we have gone from an internet where speech had the presumption of innocence, where your speech was in innocent at least until someone accused it of being guilty, to one in which all speech is guilty until proven innocent. Everything that we post is run through black box algorithms that make a judgment in the dark whose deliberations we're not privy to about whether your speech fits into these nebulous categories like sex trafficking or terrorism or copyright infringement or extremism. And this all happened on our watch. And it happened in large part because we hate the platforms and we hate them for good reason, right? No one is happy about our internet future having turned into a world that consists of five giant websites filled with screenshots from the other four. But ironically, our desire to punish the platforms is a reward in disguise. Think about how filters are going to play out. Google has already spent $100 million building a filter for YouTube. Uh, it's called Content ID. It does a small percentage of what, the art, uh, of what Article 13 envisions, and they'll be able to adapt it for that purpose. And that's why during the copyright directive debate, the CEO of YouTube wrote a public blog post on YouTube's blog saying, although we oppose the directive's broad strokes, we think that filters are probably a good idea and we can probably make them happen. Because while Google's first preference is obviously to have no regulation, their second preference is to have regulation that's so onerous that only Google can comply with it. Because there aren't any European tech startups with an extra 100 million euros kicking around to roll into filters when the, when the rule comes into effect and when they become liable to enforce under it. And so that means that the stroke of a pen, the European Union signed the death warrant for the entire tech sector. And that leaves the, the field open for a handful of US-based tech giants who can't afford filters to take over Europe's internet. And that UK porn blockade. It's going to be administered by the Canadian uh, porn giant uh, MindGeek. And MindGeek's holdings include Pornhub, RedTube, uh, Uporn, Browsers, Digital Playground, Men.com, Reality Kings, and Sean Cody. And this is a company that grew by taking any competitor that it had its eyes on and allowing uh, clips to be uploaded to its own platform uh, in a way that deprived those, those rivals of their uh, revenue that they got from their paywalls. It waited until they were brought to their knees by not uh, getting those payments, and then it bought them for pennies on the dollar. And now that company will be in charge of all of the competitors that it hasn't yet taken over, and it will get to determine their destiny too. Is it any wonder that Mark Zuckerberg went to Congress last month and said, please regulate Facebook? He's betting that with right Facebook at the table, any regulation that, that Congress makes will be regulation that Facebook can afford. Congress is not going to make a rule that says no Facebook, and that none of its competitors will be able to afford. So how do we get here? How is it that the tech sector has become so totally concentrated? Uh, well, it's not just the tech sector. Um, every sector has become concentrated over the last 40 years. There's four movie studios. It was five until last month. Now Fox and Disney are one. There's um, uh, four record labels. There's five publishers for now, but soon there should be four because the word is that Simon & Schuster will become a division of HarperCollins. 
Um, and there's only one eyewear company left. If you're wearing glasses, just have a look now at who made them. If your glasses were made by um, Armani, Brooks Brothers, Burberry, Chanel, Coach, DKNY, Dolce & Gabbana, Michael Kors, Oakley, Oliver Peoples, Purcell Ralph, uh, Polo Ralph Lauren, Ray-Ban, Tiffany, Valentino, Vogue, and Versace, or if you bought them at Pearl Vision, Sears Optical, Sunglass Hut, or Target Optical, or if you're, they were insured by iMed Vision Care, or, uh, or if your lenses were made by Elsilor, the largest maker of lenses and contact lenses in the world, they all came from one company, a company called Luxottica in Italy. And not only that, there's only one wrestling league left. <laughs> there used to be 30 of them. Now there's one. It's worth $3.5 billion. It gets to class its employees as contractors and not give them medical care, which is why they're dropping dead in their 40s. And when you ask tech sector investors how it got so big, those people have lots of answers. They'll tell you that it's because tech has first mover advantages and it has network effects. No, but that doesn't explain why everything that's not tech got so concentrated. Did wrestling get affected by network uh, effects, by first mover advantages? I think to understand how everything got so concentrated, we need to go back to a very special year, 1979. That's the year the first commercially successful personal computer hit the, hit the market, and that's the year that this guy hit the, command, hit the campaign trail and made a successful bid for, pregnancy, uh, for presidency. <laughs> Beg your pardon. And Reagan wasn't alone. Reagan was part of a cohort of politicians who all came in around that year. You had Margaret Thatcher in the UK, Brian Mulroney in Canada, you had Helmut Kohl here in Germany, you had Augusto Pinochet in Chile, obviously didn't get elected. Um, and they all took power at a moment in which the amount of wealth that was in the hands of the richest people on earth had finally rebounded from the years after the war in which the capital destruction of World War II left everybody a lot poorer. And since the people who were very rich had the most to lose, they were a lot poorer too, and they lost their uh, grip on the levers of power. But by 1979 or so, the amount of wealth that they held had reaccumulated to the point where they could start making their policy prerogatives felt and start expressing them in the public sphere. Now, Reagan subscribed to one particularly bizarre theory about how, how our uh, economy should be regulated. This theory of antitrust law that said that monopolies were fine, that antitrust's goal should not be to break up monopolies, but just to be sure that the monopolies didn't harm consumers by raising prices. And under Reagan and his successors, antitrust has been dismantled all around the world. In living memory, right, in, in, in the time that I've been alive, it was once illegal for companies to grow by merging with their largest rivals. It was once illegal by companies to be for companies to be vertically integrated, right? For a company to own both a railroad and a freight shipping company. You could either run, run the railroad or you could ship the freight the railroad carried, but not both. And companies were not allowed to buy, uh, grow by buying up their, uh, their emergent competitors. Well, in the last six months, Apple bought 20 to 25 small companies. It does that every six months. Uh, it buys companies more often than I buy groceries. Now, today, we're asked to believe that something has changed in our technology that makes monopolies inevitable, that it's to do with tech and not with law. But every one of these monopolists grew by doing things that were radioactively illegal under antitrust law. Think about Google. Apart from two products, Search and Gmail, Google has not had one significant new product that they've been able to launch internally. Everything else they do, they do because they bought another company that had been founded. Or think about Facebook. Facebook tells advertisers that it spies on us so much that it can tell exactly what we're going to do and that it can use its machine learning systems to convince us of anything an advertiser wants us to believe. Facebook tells us that they've built a machine learning mind control ray. But what Facebook really has is detailed non-consensual dossiers on 2.3 billion people around the world. And it can use those dossiers to profile us and target us. So if you're trying to locate someone with a very hard to find trait, like somebody who wants to buy a refrigerator, right, which is something most of us will never do. I think the median person buys like 1.2 refrigerators in their whole life. Then you can ask Facebook for people who searched on refrigerators, who bought a house recently, who have some money in the bank, and it will let you advertise refrigerators to them. And instead of the success rate you get when you advertise a refrigerator on a billboard on the motorway, which is like 0.00001%, you will get Facebook's much improved success rate, which is like 0.001%, right? And that's orders of magnitude more efficient, but it's hardly a mind control ray. 
And now it benefits Facebook to argue that it actually has a mind control ray. People want to buy Facebook services because people want to buy mind control rays. Companies like Cambridge Analytica told us that they'd, they'd figured out how to perfect Facebook's mind control ray, right? That they'd figured out how to point the mind control ray at decent people and make them into Trump voters and Brexit voters. But isn't it more likely that what they did was use these profiles to find racists and convince them that Trump and Brexit would be what they wanted? We know that every claim that Facebook makes is a lie. Don't take my word for it. That's what the um, Secretary of State for New Zealand said in Parliament last month. So why do we believe that they're telling the truth in their sales literature when they promise us that their product works really, really well? And even when you see a Facebook-like company that manages to change our behavior in these great big ways, what we find is that very quickly they regress to the mean. I remember the great Farmville apocalypse when everyone I knew disappeared into Farmville and didn't emerge for three months, but then they did, right? Because most of us get inured to stimulus over time. We stop uh, noticing it. We get, we get a callus over our attention. Some people don't. That's why there are people in the casino wearing adult diapers, spending their children's uh, college savings on the slot machine, right? But most people do, and it's very hard to build a business as low margin as Zynga out of, uh, out of that tiny rump of people who remain vulnerable after the initial rush, which is why Zynga, with all of the money that they made from Farmville, never managed to replicate Farmville's success. There is a Farmville too, but no one's played it. Now, users don't like Facebook, but they also can't escape Facebook because it holds their friends hostage. And even when they want to leave Facebook, there's nowhere else to go. 15 million Americans aged 13 to 34 quit Facebook last year and went to Instagram. <laughs> it's a company owned by Facebook. Now, that whole Instagram story, it's like a, a fairy tale about why we shouldn't have screwed up antitrust law. Um, few of us remember this, but for the first 10 years that Facebook was in existence, it billed itself as the pro-privacy alternative to MySpace and to Orkut. They said, we have to have a walled garden, otherwise these bad actors will ingest your data and use it to target you with advertising. The first time they released a targeted advertising product, the Beacon, they issued a groveling apology and promised they would never target us or surveil us or profile us again. But each time one of its competitors died, Facebook expanded its surveillance. And each time it did, it took a beating in the public sphere and rolled back, but to a place that was surveilling more than it was when the last competitor died. Um, Facebook dominance is uh, near total, but, uh, uh, but the market is very lucrative, right? When you have 2.3 billion users, you've got a big target on your back. And so there are lots of companies that would love to try and take aim at them. And there's only one of them that's really made a go of it. And it's a company whose whole pitch is we're like Facebook, but we're more pro-privacy, and everything you post to us disappears before anyone can mine it. They're called Snapchat. Right? Snapchat is the only competitor that, Facebook has, uh, that has managed to survive Facebook. And it shows you that what people want is a place with their friends and not spying. Right? That's, why, that's why Snapchat has been so successful. People j left Facebook by the millions to join Snapchat. So what did Facebook do? Well, Facebook had bought a spyware company called Onavo. Onavo originally made a product that it deceptively described as a battery monitor. Uh, what it did was spy on everything you do with the phone. Later on, uh, Onavo morphed into a VPN that also spied on everything you did with the phone. It used that to surveil how people were using Snapchat and to identify that acquiring Instagram would be a good hedge against the departures for Snapchat. And then it used it to refine Instagram's features based on what former Facebook users who had Onavo installed on their phone were doing with Snapchat. So today, despite a market hungry for privacy, we have no privacy uh, social network. Um, Facebook owns the users. It's not going to let them out. Uh, when Facebook started, the majority of Facebook users were actually, or potential Facebook users, were on a rival service called MySpace. And of course, although you might have liked Facebook's features better, the only reason to have those features is so you could use them to talk to your friends. And if your friends were on MySpace, you couldn't leave. So space, Facebook had a really clever solution. They made a tool that would log into MySpace and pretend to be you. You could give it your login credentials. It would log into MySpace, fetch the messages waiting for you, put them in your Facebook inbox, let you reply to them, send them back to MySpace with a footer that says, I sent this from Facebook. Why are you still using MySpace? Right? So that worked great. 
Facebook grew to dominance, MySpace withered, and then along came a company to do to Facebook what Facebook had done to MySpace called Power Ventures. They would take your waiting Facebook messages, put them in an inbox with your other waiting messages from all your other social telephones, let you reply to them in one place and send them back out again. And Facebook sued them under an ancient Ronald Reagan era law called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. They proposed a radical new theory of it. They paid a lot of money for legal services to support that theory. They put Power Ventures out of business, and now no one can do to Facebook what Facebook did to MySpace. Facebook is a, a behavioral modification device, for sure, but it only has one trick up its sleeve. All it can do is make you look at Facebook. And the way that it makes you look at Facebook is that that's where all your friends are. And so you want to, you want to talk to your friends, and so you have to take your phone out of your pocket over and over again to see what your friends are doing. And it, um, it, derives, so it derives that by hijacking our social relationships. And then Facebook has this targeting system that works better than untargeted ads, but still performs very badly. It has to show you a lot of ads before one of them generates a click that generates a sale for its advertisers. And the thing is that you and your friends just don't have enough to talk about on their own. So it has, a, um, it has a, uh, 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 an engagement maximization algorithm, which in 2019 is a fancy way of saying that they non-consensually eyeball fuck you with Trump headlines all day, so that you get into horrible arguments with your friends and generate more clicks, right? So Facebook also is an emotion control uh, ray, but all it can do is make you angry. And so you sit there being angry, wishing you could talk to your friends, then getting angry, and in the meanwhile, you're seeing refrigerator ads, and if the refrigerator ads work one in a million times, and they can get you to click a million times, they'll sell one refrigerator. So this is the tragedy, right? We're being spied on and put to such enormous personal risk, not because it works so well, but because it hardly risks. It uh, hardly works, rather. The reason Facebook has to keep coming up with new ways to spy on us is because the, each way that it finds to influence our behavior, we quickly become inured to, right? It has so little use for our data that it needs to aggregate giant mountains of it to get even the tiniest behavioral effect out of us. It, we are being sold down the river not for millions, but for pennies. Now, big tech apologists, they say the reason the industry is concentrated is because tech is different. I don't know about you, but it sure sounds to me like if you take away anti-monopoly protections, and then companies do the things that those protections used to prohibit, and then they turn into monopolies, that maybe the answer was that the anti-monopoly protections were working, and not that first mover advantage and network effects and global markets have suddenly changed the fundamental laws of economics. Now, uh, I think that maybe we could try giving those old pre-Reagan, pre-Helmut Kohl, pre-Margaret Thatcher tools ago, maybe we could start breaking up the platforms. Um, for one thing, if Facebook was a lot smaller, then the stupid mistakes it made wouldn't be nearly so consequential. There wouldn't be one place that you could go to to stream your terrorist uh, atrocity footage and reach 2.3 billion people. Now, some people, they say that Facebook isn't just the place that you go to if you want to stream your terrorist videos. It's also the place you go to if you want to turn other people into terrorists. And there is some truth to that. Between engagement algorithms that increase page views and revenues by showing users controversial material, and the ability to target users who are receptive to messages of hate speech and, and, uh, and extremism, um, the platforms make it easier than ever to recruit people into extremist movements. But if Facebook is a people-finding system and not a mind control ray, then we should be asking ourselves, why are there so many people there to be found who are vulnerable to messages of extremist radicalization? Uh, from anti-vax to the flat earth movement. And I think to understand this, we also have to think about Ronald Reagan. 40 years of neoliberal policies has made the richest among us so much richer, and everyone else so much poorer. And one of the results of this is that our institutions no longer operate on the basis of evidence. Rather, they operate to enrich the highest bidder. So when you have a, a truth-finding exercise to establish the link between tobacco and cancer, or carbon and climate change, or opioids and addiction, or the copyright directive and filters, uh, it's not paranoid or conspiratorial to say that the reason that the conclusion that our governments reach over and over again are, uh, seems so wrong is because the people we are paying to collect evidence are in the pocket of the people they're supposed to be acting as watchdogs over. And this creates a kind of breakdown, what I call the epistemological crisis. It's not that we no longer agree on what's true, it's that we no longer agree on how we know whether something is true or not. So think for a moment about the anti-vax movement. 
It's not foolish to say, as the anti-vaxxers do, that big pharma is giant and concentrated and ruthless and willing to murder the people that it's supposed to be helping if it makes more money for the company. If you need evidence of that, just look at Purdue Pharma and the other opioid vendors who spent a decade insisting that their products like, uh, uh, like fentanyl and Oxycontin were not dangerous, not addictive, that we were under-treating pain and that doctors should be writing more prescriptions while they were uh, bribing doctors to write those prescriptions, kicking off an opioid epidemic that has killed people all over the world. And in America, it's killed 200,000 people, more Americans that were killed during the Vietnam War. So it's not foolish to say, why should we trust the pharma companies? It's also not foolish to say that the regulators are letting them get away with murder. After all, when an industry only has four or five ex uh, uh, large companies in it, then anyone qualified to regulate them is probably drawn from the executive suite of those companies. You know, the last FCC chairman in the United States, the good one that Obama appointed, Comcast lobbyist, right? The new FCC, FCC chairman, the bad one that Trump appointed, Verizon lobbyist, right? There are no people who are going to end up in that seat who aren't an executive at one of those companies, and anyone who's an executive at one of those companies probably worked at two or three of the other ones and is married to someone who worked at the remaining two. <laughs> so it's inarguable that pharma companies are corrupt and that the regulators are letting them get away with murder. So it's not unreasonable to reach the conclusion that we can't trust either them or the regulators when they tell us that their products are unsafe. Now, I happen to think, I happen to know that vaccines are safe, vaccines are safe, vaccinate your kids, vaccinate yourself. But, and, I ha and though I happen to disagree with them on their conclusion, their logic is hard to fault. In the 21st century, people look to conspiracies to explain the facts around them because so much of the bad stuff around them is the result of a conspiracy. Whether that's Exxon covering up its own research that said that its products were contributing to climate change and would make our planet incapable of supporting human life, or the NSA wiretapping the whole world's internet and with the cooperation of big tech companies who swore it wasn't happening. These c conspiracies don't come cheap. The authorities that help them along with their conspiracies, they expect handsome rewards, jobs in industry, uh, campaign contributions. Um, and this is the sort of thing that you can only pull off in a new gilded age where wealth and power have been concentrated and where industries have concentrated along with them. We won't make conspiracies implausible until we get rid of conspiracies. And we can't do that until we... Thank you. Uh, we can't do that until we tackle wealth inequality. If we punish the platforms for their monopolistic abuses by imposing new duties on them that normally states would perform, duties to monitor and filter their users, we just cement their dominance. Once we dreamed of an internet that was democratic, where we would all get a say in its future, where anyone could make an internet tool and it would exist as a peer among all the other internet tools on the internet. But if we invest platforms with state-like roles in exchange for letting them grow to be so big that we could never break them up, because if we broke them up, they would be too small to enforce the terror regulation, to enforce SESTA-FOSTA, to enforce Article 13 and the Copyright Directive, then we are ending democracy and we're putting in place a constitutional monarchy where GAFAM get to rule forever with the divine right of kings and their power is only checked by an aristocracy of regulators drawn from their executive suite who ask them to uh, kindly don golden chains and restrain themselves through a sense of noblesse oblige. Thank you. We can have a pluralistic internet made up of small companies and co-ops that serve their users, or we can deputize big tech to perform state-like duties, but we can't have both. That's why it's so dangerous to hear people saying things like, if you're not paying for the product, you're the product. If you go out and spend $1,000 on an iPhone, Apple will use uh, the anti-circumvention rules uh, to, make, uh, and, uh, to make sure that you only get your device fixed by them and that you only buy apps from them so they can take 30% out of every sale. And then they will use the money that they get from that to fight and kill right to repair laws all around the world, including in the EU and most recently in Ontario, where I'm from. Because in a monopoly, even if you're paying for the product, you are still the product. Google makes money by spying on you. Apple makes money by locking you in. Facebook makes money by locking you in and by spying on you. Right? 
Adding price tags to today's free services will not make them more democratic or accountable. And if we are living under conditions of gross inequality, then making someone's ability to participate in culture contingent on their ability to pay will not produce a more democratic or pluralistic society. Here's what I'm trying to say. Techno-exceptionalism is garbage. Tech is rotten not because uh, there's something intrinsically rotten about tech, but because everything is rotten. And tech grew up in lockstep with the rot. The only way to make, make big tech better is to make it smaller, to break up the monopolies, to ban the practice of growing by merging and acquiring your nascent competitors, to crack down on vertical integration. This has been a hell of a year for the internet and for our planet and for our species. And we have some major challenges ahead of us, climate change, misogyny, white nationalism, and while I'm skeptical of the tech exceptionalism that says that we have uh, these exotic causes that have caused tech to be concentrated, I am a tech exceptionalist in one regard. Because I don't believe that the internet is what we fight for, but I believe it's what we fight with. The internet, the internet is the terrain on which every battle that's coming will be fought on to win or lose. And if we lose the internet, we will lose those battles before they're fought. We are very focused today on what technology does, but if we really want to solve the problems of tech, we should be focused on what it, who it does them to and who it does them for. We once dreamed of a democratic tech future. We once taught kids STEM, not so they'd be ready for the job market, but so that they could have technological self-defense, so that they could program so they wouldn't be programmed. And a democratic, anti-oligarchic technological future is still possible if we seize the means of computation and use it to organize and demand a future where we are neither spied upon nor locked in, a future where technology sets us free and never puts us in chains. Thank you. Thanks. So, thank you. Um, thanks. So, Thank you. Um, we have about eight minutes for questions. I like to call alternately on people who identify as women and non-binary, and then people who identify as male or non-binary. And usually when I say that, there's like kind of a pause, because speaking as a man, I can tell you that a great plurality of the men have been spending a great deal of the time thinking up a cool question that will make them sound smart, and the women have been paying attention. But sometimes if I tell that joke, enough time will have gone by that a woman or someone who identifies as non-binary has thought of a question. So if there's someone who fits that description who'd like to ask the first question, if you could raise your hand, we have a mic runner. I can also vamp for a while before we get to it if someone wants to think of a question. Do we have one there? All right, thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, what are the best options uh, for the elections of parliament in Europe to help Hi. us with these problems? W what are the best options for the parliamentary elections in Europe? That is a really good question. Who should we vote for? Who, yeah, I don't know who to vote for. I uh, um, spoke with a colleague today who said that you should ask anyone who wants your vote whether they will refer the copyright directive to the European Court of Justice uh, for a judgment on its constitutionality. I think that's probably a, a good heuristic anyway. Um, you know, I, I, thank you. And, and I just, I, I vote in the UK by proxy, so I just instructed my proxy on who to vote for. And uh, my vote's going for the slate that's been put forward by Extinction Rebellion for whatever that's worth. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, thanks for inspiring talk. So I'm following up on the last thing you said, right. seize the means of computation. Yeah. So are you more dreaming of a sort of uh, anarcho uh, syndicalism or are you more dreaming of a regulated capitalism? So I think that um, our approach to how we should run our society should be on an evidentiary footing, right? So, so I think the question you're asking is what's best, and I don't know what's best, but I know how we find out what's best, right? So this is a bit like the scientific method, right? With the scientific method, we say um, not what is true, but how do we find out what's true? And the way we find out what's true is by having pluralistic, uh, rigorous, and accountable truth-seeking uh, 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 systems of governance. And the precondition for, a, for a, a, an accurate and um, and accountable truth-seeking exercise is that there can't be one player in the room that when they speak, everyone else has to listen to them because they will always clobber the truth because the truth is always antith antithetical to the parochial goals of any one giant player. Because, and so 
my, my, my goal is first what we need to have is pluralism. So we need to have pluralism in wealth distribution. We need to have pluralism in industry, right? And from there, our, our regulatory apparatus will once again be able to establish different answers to different questions. When do we need markets? When do we use planning and so on? But we can't hope to answer those questions unless we have a rigorous process. So it's, it's, it's as though we've reverted to the days of alchemy. Right? In the days of alchemy, no one exposed their conclusions to uh, rigorous review by third parties who disagreed with them. And so every alchemist drank mercury, right? Because no one ever told them that, I think your evidence is poor, because they never had to be accountable to an outsized source. And right now, we have, like the, the, we have very close equivalents in our policy sphere. You know, I, I think that anyone who says, you know, as Justin Trudeau did, that um, Canada should continue to burn the, the filthiest oil on earth, the tar sands, because, quote, no country is going to leave $2 billion, $2 trillion worth of tar, of coal in the, or oil in the ground, right? That that's, that's just drinking mercury for the planet. Uh, in, in West Virginia, where Dow Chemical is the largest uh, player in the largest industry, uh, chemical processing, they, they just had an, an evidentiary hearing on whether the um, national levels for uh, chemical runoff in the water should be uh, made more relaxed in West Virginia, which obviously they shouldn't. Uh, and, and Dow presented evidence, and they said it, they should be because the national levels are set based on the average body mass index of the average American. And in West Virginia, they're so much fatter that we can poison them more before they get sick, right? So this is what you get when the evidentiary process is dominated by a single player, right? Like, that's just, you know, like basically, Dow, someone handed someone at Dow Chemical a piece of paper, and there was a like, you are gonna get your goal if you write anything in this box that says reason. And they sort of, you know, um, drank some whiskey and came up with a reason. West Virginians are fat. Right? Give, us our, give us our chemical runoff regime. And so I, I, I think that like presupposing the answer is, is uh, it's, it's ahead of, it's, it's ahead of the, the, the um, it's premature, right? That what we should have first is a mechanism that reliably produces good pluralistic answers that have the consent of the governed and have legitimacy. And then we'll figure out whether or not we are, uh, you know, living in a narco-syndicalist society or whatever. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I've Hi. got a question relating to New Zealand, where I'm from. Yeah. And you mentioned that there's been a big pushback after the white nationalist attacks. And the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, and Emmanuel Macron from France are hosting a summit next Wednesday to develop regulation. What would be an ideal outcome from your perspective for that summit? So uh, I think that um, anything that we do to regulate Facebook per se, right, to say, okay, well, you're going to have a platform and 2.3 billion people are going to speak on it, and it's going to be the only place in which um, you can really, like, form communities and mobilize people to action, but you're also going to have a duty to police your speech, uh, the speech of all those users. Anything that we say is just going to work out very badly. I think, if anything, the fact that there's one place where if you live stream your, your atrocity, everyone can see it, um, tells you that, uh, that the answer has to be that there shouldn't be a, a centralized locus of power the way that Facebook has become. You know, that, that uh, if we can tinker around the margins by imposing duties on Facebook, the likely outcome of that is that those duties will put a floor under how small we can make Facebook in the future. And the streaming of the white nationalist attack is one of many ways in which Facebook uh, and its dominance has proven to be very toxic. And if, if we can't split Facebook up and make it non-dominant in the future, then um, we're going to get into all kinds of trouble in all kinds of ways. So I think a lot about the example of Cambodia, where Facebook is the de facto way that you communicate with other Cambodians. And in Cambodia, uh, the dictator, the autocrat, nearly lost an election in 2013 because the opposition movement used Facebook to mobilize uh, voters and a political opposition for the first time in living memory. And um, as a response, he, he hired a bunch of Facebook consultants. Facebook is still the only place that Cambodians can talk to one another, but because Facebook has all of these policies in place, um, he is able to use Facebook to cement his dominance. So if you're um, from the Cambodian diaspora and you live abroad, 
Uh, he has paid trolls that will goad you into crossing the hate speech lines that Facebook has established to stop people from, from harassment and so on. So they'll draw you across the line while standing on the line themselves because they're Facebook policy experts and you're not. You're a Cambodian dissident living in exile. And so he gets those people kicked off. If you're a Facebook user living in, or a Cambodian Facebook user living in Cambodia and you uh, oppose the government, um, and you don't use your real name, he'll get you kicked off Facebook for not using your real name because that's also a Facebook policy. And if you're on Facebook and you're in Cambodia and you're using your real name and you're opposing the government, government he'll have you arrested. And so the only answer to this is not to like make more Baroque rules for Facebook and how it moderates content. The answer is to make Facebook's content moderation decisions less consequential. We need to have lots of places where people can talk and gather because for so long as power is concentrated into Facebook's hands, they will be incapable of using it wisely, right? The reason that Facebook is, is incompetent when it comes to managing 2.5 billion users' personal lives is not because they're idiots. They hire some really smart people. It's because there is no one who is, is smart enough and there will never be someone who's smart enough to manage the social lives of 2.5 billion people. It's an impossible task that they've set for themselves. And the only reason that they're able to, allow, uh, to, able to go on doing it is because of monopolies. And so I know it's unrealistic, right? Because people want solutions, not, um, root, not identification of root causes. But you know, if, if you show up and you say, um, you know, I've, 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 I've got a real problem uh, with, my, with my house and it's sinking, uh, and what can I do? And I say, well, it's because it's on a sinkhole, you're going to have to move. And you say, no, 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 you, there must be something I can do with the foundation to fix it. Anything that we do is just going to result in it sinking again next year and next year and next, and we're just going to build up policy debt. So I think the only answer is that we have to make Facebook smaller so that the bad decisions that Facebook makes, its, it's inability to identify that, that stream, <laughs> are less consequential. And we're out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.